All right, let's get started. My name is Katherine Lohide, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Formstack, and we're excited to host today's panel on the rise of the no-code economy. Before we dive in with our panelists, let me give you a little background on Formstack. For 15 years, we've helped more than 27,000 organizations reimagine their world of work with our no-code workplace productivity platform. Customers all over the world use our digital forms, document automation, and e-signature solutions to do everything from streamlining the patient intake process to automating marketing and sales workflows. We're excited to be joined by a few of NoCode's biggest names as they discuss how NoCode is impacting companies and employees and how you can take advantage of the economy that's quickly emerging. Today's discussion will also review some of the findings from our NoCode economy report, which was released today. Let's go over a couple of housekeeping items to ensure today's session runs smoothly. Please submit questions through the Zoom Q&A feature. We'll get through as many of those as we can at the end of today's discussion. And we'll also send a recording of today's event in the coming days. Now I'll hand it off to our moderator and head of education at Adalo, Lacey Kessler, to lead the discussion. Hi, I am so thrilled to be here with you today. My name is Lacey Kessler and I am the head of education at Adalo, where we build mobile apps without writing any code. Um, today, we are joined by some fabulous guests and we are going to talk through this report and talk about no code in general as a way so that you can understand how it's going to take us into the future of software development. So to kick us off, I'm gonna bring on Chris, the CEO of Formstack. Thanks, Lacey. Uh, great to be here. Uh, as Catherine talked about, Formstack has been around for 15 years, really helping that non-technical user get successful in building uh, just important solutions and, and use cases to solve critical problems that exist in their everyday work. And so uh, we're excited to be here and participate in this conversation. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Emmanuel and uh, founder and co-CEO of Bubble. Uh, I I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, in this discussion, but no code is a spectrum, right? In terms of how flexible it is and how much learning curve it takes. And Bubble is very clearly on one extreme of that spectrum where it's very powerful and takes longer to learn. And today people use us mostly to create fairly complicated web applications, either for existing businesses or to start their companies. And it's great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Vlad uh, Magdalene from Webflow. Uh, we're also, surprise, surprise, in the no-code space. Um, and we focus a lot on uh, websites and content-heavy uh, marketing sites and, and things like that. And we started uh, with the original vision of democratizing software creation. And, and we're starting with websites, which are kind of like software light uh, and, and moving kind of down, down the stack as we um, uh, help bring more and more functionality uh, to websites. And I'm super excited to be here. And there's some great people here. Uh, I love seeing some friendly faces and looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. All right, well, let's get started. So Chris, thank you so much for having us, you and the Formstack team. Let's point this first question to you. So the 2021 no-code economy survey revealed that 82% of people are unfamiliar with the term no-code. Why do you think that may be? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge that we face is, well, of course, no code is, is a bit of a, a market phrase that we use to describe something that we understand. Um, but most people, as I've experienced over time, they think about solving use case problems. They say, I need to collect leads, or I need to build a website to do whatever, or I need to start selling something online. And so I, I think that people really understanding that there's a set of tools out there to solve lots and lots of those problems uh, it is just not nearly hasn't been educated enough. And I think this is a great conversation to start that education and help get more people understanding that you don't always have to search for just the use case. Can I actually search for a set of tools, a set of solutions that help me solve more problems? Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Vlad? Uh, I'll, I'll echo what Chris said. I think a lot of people don't think of categories uh, as much as they think of things that can solve their individual problems. Like technically you can think of Excel as no code because a lot of the things that uh, people do in Excel today, people used to solve with mainframes and um, you know 
hard code, like hard coded solutions 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, when pretty much every bank was doing financial modeling um, using Pascal or Fortran, et cetera. And even today, people don't, don't kind of associate, it, associate, associate Excel with, hey, this is like a no code thing or a uh, kind of a broad category of spreadsheets. They sort of think like Excel can solve my problem. It can help me like add stuff. It can help me create charts and graphs, et cetera. And no code is kind of in that same category where the people who are aware of the term are the early adopters. They're kind of aware of like the industry and the space and the category of related tools and services and how they link together. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, most uh, say quote unquote normal people uh, don't think of marketing categories or a category definition. They're kind of like, hey, what is out there that can help me solve my problem? So in that sense, we're kind of in the early adopter phase uh, where people are still getting to know the universe and landscape of available tools uh, and, and still learning that um, these capabilities are even available to them. Once they realize that they're there, that's when they start learning about the space and the category, et cetera. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Um, okay, next question for Emmanuel. 66% of people using no-code tools first began using them within this last year. What do you think has led to the dramatic rise over the past 12 to 24 months? I think it's a combination of two things. I mean, the way we see it from our side, and it's probably something true about any no-code platform. It's a combination of um, tools got better, because at some point, delivering the value that, you know, the promise we're making when we tell someone, hey, build Airbnb without code, it's a very hard problem to solve. And it takes a long time for products to be good enough to do that. So that's the first thing. And at the same, same time, I think this whole like learn how to code thing, which now feels like you know, history, right? It's old. But in 2015, 2016, it was all about learning how to code. People started realizing that, sure, you might go through like coding boot camps, you might spend, you know, a few tens of hours on Code Academy. But getting from that to being able to push something that works in production that solves a business problem is actually harder. Like not many people going through these kind of tools or programs were able to do this. And I think the conjunction of realizing that, okay, learning how to code, first of all, is not for everyone. And if you really want to be able to create something that will help your business, will take a lot of hours and the tools getting better. Uh, the two things happening together uh, made it blow up um, as we see today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that makes a lot of sense. I was talking with David, the CEO of Dalla. We are running through all of these questions and we were talking about how it seems like the population is like there's a more majority of millennial or Gen Z. And so we have all grown up with software. We've had personal computers. We got onto all of these um, systems really early. And so we began to kind of like wrap our head around at a younger age what you know, what we could build, what we want to build and how to do it. And now as, you know, the tech is evolving and catching up, it's like we finally have the tools and resources to go out and build our own apps and programs and websites and all the things that we've kind of been playing on for years. Would you agree? Um, I'm not sure, actually. When I look at our user base, we have a lot of people in their 50s, 60s using us as well. And the, these are the people that were having a lot of fun with you know, Microsoft Access in the 90s, which I think a lot of people have forgotten that software, but it was one of the most powerful software of the business world. Like All businesses were running on this between the 90s and 2000, 2002. Uh, probably some businesses still use it today. Um, and I, what we noticed is that we have a certain category of users that we're basically looking for Microsoft access for the web. And so with Bubble, that's a little bit how I could describe Bubble in some ways. Um, so certainly each new generation that joins the workforce is more digitally native, but I wouldn't discard like the presence of like people from the older times of technology. In many ways, um, back to your first question, no code is hot today, but I would argue that the golden age for no code might be today. But in the 90s, uh, I think it was another golden age for no code, you know, with publisher, um, front page, uh, access, all these different tools. And I think we see a category of people that are like, oh, finally, this is coming back. And they felt like, you know, we technology kind of forgot, had forgotten them for about 10 years. Yeah, I think that um, just to jump in here, I think the uh, the real reason why we're seeing a lot more adoption is not because these tools are new, 
but it's because people are seeing more and more proof that what people are building with the tools uh, is actually tangible and can help run a business or help create a product or help uh, launch something off the ground. Uh, I totally agree with Emmanuel. Like the, the 90s, I remember being inspired by Visual Studio and Dreamweaver and all, it was the same idea. It was like, how do we get the the power of software engineering into the hands of more people. Um, but I think the execution combined with kind of the, the kinds of things people were creating, um, at least very visibly, didn't give people a lot of confidence uh, that, that this was a, a very scalable way to build software. But now through the last like five years or so, we're seeing more and more proof points where people are seeing like, hey, this was built exclusively on no code with no code technologies, or this was, uh, you know, bootstrapped with no code technologies. There's a lot more kind of social proof that that these tools are working. Um, and I think that just speaks to the maturity of the tools. And uh, I think a huge factor is the is the power of the internet, because back in the 90s, you could build these things, right? But distribution was really hard. Uh, you could build something with Visual Studio and Access and, you know, Visual Fox Pro, et cetera. Um, but it was really hard to uh, get it out into the real world. Right now, we have just the sheer volume of more people having access to these tools and uh, getting them out into the real world. And then that sort of is a self-reinforcing loop because more people see those successes and then they think, look, maybe I can do that. And then they go out looking for tools that can help enable them to do that, that, that don't require you to you know, get a boot camp degree or a computer science degree, et cetera. Yeah, so jumping off of what you just said, then let's go into our next question. Why do you think businesses should invest in no code tools? Like pitch me on it, sell me on the whole thing right now. <laughs> you know, what, one thing I would jump in with is just the idea that uh, most people on the front lines know how to solve problems. Like if you gave them a piece of paper and said like, draw out this better process for me or draw out this better solution, they could do that really, really quickly. I think in, in most cases, they're, they're bright enough to do it. They can see the problems at a granular level. It's just the moment where they're like, oh, okay, now do something about that. Well, I've got to go call IT or I've got to call an engineer or I've got to go buy a big piece of custom software or whatever. And to me, it, it's about kind of, destroying some of those uh, just barriers to getting going and getting the problem solved quickly. Because as we know, if sometimes if we don't solve something pretty quickly, we lose energy, we lose kind of the passion to get it done. And that by itself kills too many projects. And so giving, giving those tools to people kind of on the front lines to me is, is one of the keys. What do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, adding to this, I think uh, not only enables to move faster, it also make, ensures that people who actually build the product to solve a problem know the problem very well because they're exposed to it. What we see in the old world, like the coding world, is you, usually the product person, the person with the product vision, is going to be not the builder, and you have an engineer that transcribes basically what that person has in mind into code. It can work great, but it's a tedious process. And sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, if it were working very well, software outsourcing would be a beautiful experience. And we all know that it's not the case. <laughs> Most of the time when you order something, what's going to come back to you is not exactly what you had in mind. So to share an example, for instance, internally, because we use Bubble internally for a lot of things, uh, we didn't have a CRM until recently. And we never found the right tool that were, was doing exactly what we wanted. It had to integrate with the front that we use for the messaging system and everything. And so we had a success associate from our team, non-technical, but as a success associate, he knows how to use Bubble well, who built the CRM himself entirely. And so as a result, not only we got that to market, I mean, the market was internally here faster, but then we have a CRM that does exactly what we want. And had we had a different process where we would build something custom with engineers internally, first of all, it would have been much longer to build. And I'm pretty sure the end result would not have been uh, exactly what we needed and we would have gone through a lot of iterations. Uh, and I think that that what we did internally is what our users do and that what people using no code do uh, around the world because fundamentally it enables them to get the product they need faster and exactly what they need because they can get what they have in their, in their head directly to a computer and build a product that does what they expect it to do. You're muted. The, the classic uh, 2020, 2021 <laughs> muted. Um, to me, it's, it's exactly what, um, what businesses look at when they choose any tool to solve a, a problem, right? They look at efficiency, they look at speed, they look at cost, et cetera. And no code is uh, sometimes the best tool for the job. It's not always the best tool for the job. Sometimes the best tool for the job is code uh, when things are really, really complex. 
And this pattern repeats over and over through history, right? Like a lot of businesses use Excel now because the old way of doing it is kind of slower and more expensive because you need developers involved. Uh, businesses have over the last 15, 20 years have moved to essentially no hardware, right? Everybody used to uh, rack their own servers and have their own uh, data centers. And now they just, you know, rent uh, computing power from a cloud provider uh, because that's for most intents and purposes, cheaper in the long run uh, because it, it costs a lot less in labor. Um, and it helps them do a lot more. It doesn't mean that developers lose jobs. Uh, it means that they can actually uh, take on a much wider scope of, of what that business is doing. And no code is, is the same. Like a lot of times solving something with no code, like with the example of Webflow, people go or companies go from having to have two, three, four engineers involved in uh, pushing out marketing sites to having zero engineers. Uh, and having a few or just sometimes one content designers or marketing designers uh, completely own the entire production uh, website experience. That is way more efficient, lets the, the company tell their story better, lets them iterate faster, um, and it helps those engineers go focus on things that are way more complex, uh, whether it's in product, et cetera. So, so uh, for most intents and purposes, like it's just the best tool for the job for where no code has actually like risen to the level of abstraction and capability uh, that it can solve those same problems to the same, uh, like Emmanuel mentioned, to the same degree that you would uh, in code when it reaches that complexity, then it's just kind of a an obvious approach to go do it faster, cheaper, better. Um, and, and no code is really catching up uh, in, in that regard. Yep, yep, I totally agree. So as far as these companies adopting the tools, are there considerations, things that you're thinking around um, of how, and this is a free for all um, question, but um, how to enable their workforce without going into things like shadow IT or data silos. If you have multiple teams using multiple tools, different workflows, do you have thoughts around that of what it could look like to centralize or just adoption of a specific tool or tool set? I can talk about from our perspective when companies use us. I mean, obviously limiting the number of tools a company uses is beneficial usually, right? Because it makes the learning curve a little bit less challenging and people communicating better. That said, uh, most no-code tools, uh, and Bubble in particular, which obviously is a tool I know better, tend to play very pre pretty well with other tools. Like I think in 2020, and that's one thing that was not probably the case 10, 15 years ago, and certainly enabled no-code to be much more powerful. A lot of now modern tools have the same standards to communicate with each other, uh, through, you know, whether it's API calls or any kind of connection, uh, which enables people to deal with the same data uh, that the company will have. Uh, in uh, in a pretty standardized way. That said, again, I mean, I, I think where it becomes important is the learning curve of the tools. And if you want to share the knowledge, it's easier if, especially when a company has like that 50 people, having people using the same thing. But even if they don't, the tools now are set up in a way that they can talk to each other pretty well. Yeah, I think there's, um, I agree with that. I think there's always going to be downsides to a lot of, um, you know, as different folks in the organization figure out and learn different tools or, or um, kind of explore and find different tools that they believe can solve their problems. And they can't, you know, as a centralized like CIO or something like that, do a full audit of like what other tools are being used in the company or where is data stored. Um, you're going to have situations where uh, there's going to be like duplication or, um, you know, potentially some things that if a uh, centralized organization looks uh, after the fact, they're going to discover, okay, like maybe we have more duplication or more uh, kind of tool prol proliferation than we would have had if we, you know, were approving every single um, deployment, et cetera. But I think the trade-off is much better in the sense that you have way more knowledge workers figuring out how to solve key production problems um, and getting to market faster and validating those problems faster. So that is a much bigger benefit than some of the some of the um, drawbacks that you might have from you know multiple tools being used in production. So that that is kind of a good problem to have because then by that point, if it actually truly matters that you want like data consolidated, you've actually gotten to the point where you know it's solving a real production use case, um, and it's a good problem to have. Then you can figure out does it make sense to you know link some of these tools together to to share data, um, aggregate things, etc. 
so for the most part, it's a democratizing force where, you know, it just enables a lot more people to do, to solve the problems that they, that they want. Of course, that comes with trade-offs. It's the same way that, you know, when AWS was first starting and if developers were starting to use it kind of like one-off within organizations, it caused a lot of headaches because people were thinking like, okay, what is, what is the security story? What is like the uh, data uh, privacy, privacy story? How are we going to be backing the, these things up? But people figured it out over time because it was just a much more efficient way to, uh, to do computing and, and storage, et cetera. Um, so I think it's just, you know, no code in general, like the conglomeration of tools are going to go through some growing pains in that regard, where some people are going to be like, well, these are the problems that it causes when it rolls out through, through an organization. Uh, but largely they are smaller side effects to a much bigger uh, benefit once people start to adopt these tools uh, within a larger org. Yeah, one, one thing I just quickly add is I think there's a wonderful opportunity for executive teams to, to step in and say, we are going to embrace no code technology because I think it then says, oh, I actually probably need to educate my workforce on how to use these better and how to like what types of problems might you wanna solve with it. But if, any, if last year was any example about remote, even if, if a year and a half ago you said, I want to go remote, it would have been this very difficult, slow process. But when an executive team last, case, in last year was forced to, but <laughs> makes those decisions, that top-down support gets IT on board, gets everybody on board really quickly. And I actually think we'll get you ahead of uh, people in, in the curve of how do we collaborate and solve problems in, in our organization. And one thing I'll add, which uh, a little bit what Vlad was saying with AWS, a lot of the Critic not criticism, but concerns we hear with no code tools are exactly the same you would have with code and like older tools. It's just we have forgotten that because it was 15 years ago and it still looks somewhat familiar because it's code. But guess what? You have different frameworks, you have different languages, you have different, a lot of different things, you know, uh, and that becomes a headache for companies. And it's not like, you know, companies uh, have never problems with traditional technologies. So. I, I know it can be a little bit scary to move to something new, um, but I, I would also say, like, try to remember what it looked like 10 years ago, and it's fine. You know, like you made some mistakes. It's no code is not different from code uh, in many ways in this uh, thing. And on the flip side, it's faster to get to a solution. So I think the net win is pretty obvious. Yeah. And it's faster to get to failure if, you know, right. the idea that you have for a product just doesn't work in the market, then you, you've invested a lot less to throw away um, and you can move on to the next thing. Yep. Yep. Excellent answers. Excellent. Okay. 50%, 56% of people who know how to write code use no code tools. Why do you think there's been such a great adoption by coders? Let's go with Chris. Well, ironically, our, our business was founded by a software engineer who said, I'm tired of building custom forms when I build, when I'm trying to solve actually really important problems with whatever custom project I've been hired to solve. And so I actually think it speaks to what we're all seeing here, which is even if we have the technical skills, most of this is just speeding up the stuff that we probably find somewhat tedious anyway. And then we get to get onto the real creative work that is solving the, the core problem. And so to me, that actually means a lot more technical people will love to adopt and, and will continue to adopt no code potentially faster than everybody else because they can then get back to, oh, this is what the... HR team called me to solve and let me go fix that actual problem rather than a lot of the, the, the kind of minutia that can weigh them down. Yeah, I mean, uh, totally. I think the biggest impact on, of no code might actually be that finally we free the time of engineers to do like value adding things, you know, so, sometime like not to be too controversial, but I think there are a lot of startup, consumer startups out there that basically delivers the same product, you know, like to their customers, the, the color is different, the brand is different, maybe the practice, uh, we know with the people that are on their platform are different, but fundamentally from a software standpoint, it's very similar. And I think if we can find ways so that these companies use less engineers, because, you know, we have higher level of abstractions, the net win for the world is going to be fantastic, because we don't know what these engineers are going to do, but they're going to do something that actually creates, solves new problems. Like the whole point of higher level of abstractions, like no code is, to stop reinventing the wheel um, and solve the same problems constantly. Now, one, one thing I, I add though, um, so for Bubble specifically, we actually polled our users recently, only 15% of our users have some kind of technical expertise, I mean, claim some technical expertise. So I, I want to make sure that the takeaway from this is not that no code is for coders, like no code is definitely also for business people. And in our case, much more for business people than coders. But coders yeah. will have a great value out of it. 
I think the same with same with us, uh, where kind of the percentage of uh, highly technical to to however you define technical, mostly coders uh, make up a pretty small percentage of our user base, where it's primarily designers and, and folks like that who are using our product. Um, and I think the reason why it's not surprising that developers are um, are using this stuff is exactly what. Chris and Emmanuel said is that it just saves time. Uh, developers are always looking for abstractions. You know, they would, uh, you know, myself as a developer, it's much easier for me when I was first starting Webflow to click like add new server on AWS's, uh, pan you know, UI panel, than have to go figure out their API and figure out how to like authenticate and go send a request that creates a server. It just solves the same problem, much faster, more convenient for me. Same reason I would use like dev tools uh, in a, uh, you know, in a browser to do think a lot of things visually, uh, because that's direct manipulation just helps me kind of not have to map a lot of things in, in my head. It's just a faster way of doing things. So developers are always looking for efficiency. Um, so that's not surprising at all. Yeah, yeah. What's that? There's some saying. It's probably not great to say, but it's like a, the best engineer is a lazy engineer because they like, they're going to find ways to automate all of that work, get it going. So they're not repeating the same thing. Yep. It's made me think of that. Um, okay. So what challenges or hurdles do you see in getting wider adoption of no code tools? Let's go back to you, Vlad. I'm actually curious what you think first, Lacey. <laughs> Because you, you're um, like yeah. a, a pioneer in terms of adopting no code. Uh, yeah. and you see, you've seen a lot of people, you know, struggle with these challenges. So I'm kind of curious from your perspective, because we're kind of like insiders here uh, talking about our own products to, uh -huh. to a degree, uh -huh. but I'm curious uh, what you think. Yeah, yeah. So I think, and I look at this from an education standpoint as well. I think education is the big hurdle, right? Because no code, in my opinion, lives in like a little tech bubble on Twitter and we all hang out and we all talk our little tech things and think that the world knows what we're talking about and they have no idea because most of the world they want a solution they don't really like they're not getting into the you know whether or not you actually wrote the html or not they just want a website so um, i think education around this is crucial to pushing us forward which is something that i've been passionate about from the beginning um, because we are essentially saying, okay, you have a problem and these tools can solve it. But we also have to teach you how to recognize your problem, not just, you know, that you're automating, you're, you're manually going through this process a hundred times, or you need a website. And so you're like stuck, don't even think that you could do it or even know where to go or a web app or a mobile app or all of these things. And these tools are solutions. And so I think part of it is getting um, education around how to essentially solve your own problems, because that's what I firmly believe that no code is great for. Well, yeah. And I might add that, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, you know, I, I think this year, as, as anytime we go out these days, we see these mask signs and, and all of our brains have gotten attuned to this is now going to guide me as to how do I interact with this business or whatever. And, and I think there's something about that education and I'll, I'll, I'll use the word propaganda, but it's this convincing people that this is a great solution to your problems. That sounds bad. I know it's good. E it's evangelism good. is nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> better, that's better. Uh, but it's this top of mind problem that we need to be reminded over and over and over and over again. And so how do we as businesses help educate? And if you adopt this mask, uh, you're going to be in a great place because you're going to remember this is how I solve important problems. Yeah, I'd, I'd also say just awareness and literacy of like software concepts and, and the kind of problem software can solve is, you know, 90% of the battle. Uh, because to a lot of people, it's like this abstract concept. They might hear like, oh, some kid created uh, Facebook in his dorm room, right? Or uh, there are like these tech companies that solve problems or they're using software every day on their computers and laptops. But it, it hasn't clicked that they can, whenever they see a real world problem in their own life, whether tracking something or automating something, that it's even in the realm of possibility that they might have a tool that, that will solve that. So it's almost like, you have a bunch of nails, right? And getting people to realize that there's a hammer that you can go solve a lot of uh, different um, use cases with, right? And not just like in a business context, even like in a personal context. So I think a lot will have to even start with the same way that we think about 
teaching kids how to code uh, is teaching even at the earlier, um, like maybe even elementary school school level, uh, the concepts behind uh, software creation and, and uh, what connected software can do and what kind of problems it can solve, and an introduction to some of the tools that, that help people discover that and take advantage of it. Um, the same way that, that um, you know, decades ago, I think in the 90s, uh, schools would teach things like HyperCard uh, on Apple, where they would teach kids to sort of like, hey, if you uh, have recipes that you want to track or you want to track your chores, like here's how you would do that in HyperCard on an Apple, right? That That's sort of long gone at this point, but we need like that level of elementary education to, to get people to the awareness of like, hey, this is a, a tool that is like, uh, or a set of tools that is very uh, broadly applicable to a lot of different problems in your life. The same way that people probably think about spreadsheets today, like you don't second guess, oh, hey, I have like a bunch of events to track. I'm just going to open up, you know, whether it's Airtable or Google Sheets or whatever. Um, it's sort of an, an immediate like, oh, I can solve this problem with that. I have a math problem. I use a calculator, et cetera. Uh, the same way, I think a lot more, we're so far away from people thinking like, oh, I have a, a problem that can be solved with software. Boom. I have like a kind of a, a constellation of possibilities I can go explore that I know I can solve that problem with. We're nowhere near there. We're kind of like starting to, um, uh, kind of get into that with some entrepreneurs, like Lacey, like you mentioned, kind of the Twitter sphere. Uh, people are starting to recognize this. There's there's more public awareness, but we're so far away from mass adoption and awareness that that this is uh, a set of tools that people could use. Yeah, I mean, for us, most of our evangelization work uh, is really around education, whether it's to distribute our own boot camps or trying to get them into some curriculums. Like we're talking. Mm -hmm. Uh, include high schools and universities. That's a lot of what we're doing right now, trying to be in the, in the place of uh, teach people how to build uh, products to solve their problems. And that's really something I see a lot of potential. One thing I'd add though, uh, I still think we need a little bit of more like social validation as well in terms of successful stories. I don't think education is the only thing we, win, uh, we need here. I mean, it's, education is the enabler. We're still in a space where the skepticism, in particular from the technical community, is not negligible. Like we still hear, you know, so with us at Bubble, like at first, our claim was always, you know, we're going to enable you to build Twitter or Airbnb without code. For about five years, engineers were like, no, nah, that can, can be true. Then we, at some point, we were showing them, you know, well, look, I mean, we, a non technical person built that. And then they're like, okay, that won't scale. So that's the next thing we hear. So it's kind of the next frontier. What we need is to show that it's, it can scale. And so for that, we need successful success stories. And that's another thing we try to do is, now it, it is happening a lot on Twitter, it's true. And so you want to make sure it doesn't stay within the small world of early adopters. So we need to find the right channels to expand that message and amplify it. But what we need to make sure is that people understand that, oh, actually you can build real things on that on platform like this. Whether you're starting a startup, you can raise that much money. If you sold like a small business or a medium business, this is the kind of number of employees you can manage through a tool like this. Like there are many ways to showcase that. So that at some point, not only people will have the skill, but they will have the confidence that you know they can actually build a real problem at scale. Uh, which today, from our case, from what we're hearing, that is still one of the concerns. You know, like every every day we get people emailing, what if I reach that scale? How will Bubble handle this? And mm -hmm. we get we can always, you know give data points and everything internally, but at some point, these things have to come from the outside of the public knowledge. I, I would even reframe that um, to reset expectations, because you can think of it, think, think of a uh, an analogy to the movie industry, right? You could say, we're gonna democratize the movie industry that anybody can make a movie, right? But realistically, you cannot, with one individual, build the next blockbuster, like Avatar or whatever. It's still gonna require the kind of age old, huge uh, budgets, you know, huge uh, visual effects, um, kind of uh, teams, et cetera, et cetera. However, now we've proven to the world, we have social validation around an individual being able to create a huge audience and community and make a living through like YouTube or some, some other way in this, this kind of like creator and influencer economy. Uh, you actually have way, way more examples of that than people who are now creating blockbuster movies uh, as an individual, right? So I think um, even if we don't have like the next Airbnb 
at full scale created with no-code tools, but we have a thousand, 10,000 or hundred thousand, like very small software deployments created successfully where they're leading to, you know, people making a living, creating a new product or whatever. I think that will be even more validation uh, because people will see those stories of like, hey, I can create something that can like sustain myself or a small team, et cetera, rather than here's like this massive, uh, you know, deployment that's, uh, you know, in my humble opinion, I think will always require some sort of code because it's always like on the bleeding edge of, of what's possible. Uh, but we need both, probably. Um, yeah, I'm laughing because now we get into the controversial aspect of this, which is good. Uh, yeah. I, I do think Facebook, probably not. I think Facebook will be migrating similarly to, you know, at some point Dropbox had to migrate from AWS. Mm -hmm. But I think Airbnb is still on AWS, right? Or if they're not, it's another of these cloud, cloud providers. The point being, I think there are some massive businesses that can still be building on top of some other technologies and didn't have to rebuild everything internally. M my goal with no code and where I hope it is in 10 years is that I hope the next Airbnb is running on no code, uh, like five or 10 years from now. Um, but it's also, I think uh, that's a very clear product direction we've taken. Like our positioning as a product was to be the platform you don't need to graduate from. Uh, and it's hard and it's not like we succeed all the time, but that's very much what the team is trying to do. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm laughing because I think that's fundamentally where we, we see things a little bit differently, which is good yeah, because yeah. it maximizes the chance that no code will succeed. I mean, if everybody were trying to do the same thing, um, then, you know, if we all wrong or all right, you know, like here, we're right, right. the bets as a nuclear space, which is good. Totally good. Good deal. I like some spark going back and forth. This is good. <laughs> um, okay, what do you foresee happening with developer jobs as low code and no code approaches uh, to become more commonplace? What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I just believe this will accelerate kind of the, to the discussion earlier that technical uh, people can get to some of the work that they really want to get to anyway. And so to, to me, this continues just to support uh, just as many engineers getting onto those bleeding edge problems and, and solving them. Uh, so I, I think that it's a good path ahead for them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't think engineers have to worry any second about not having jobs. Like, let's be clear, no code is not going to make people not have jobs. Similarly to, you know, all the SaaS tools we've seen over the last decades that provide a lot of software as a service, supposedly you would assume that you don't need engineers anymore, right? Because you're going to have a SaaS for everything. Well, guess what? The demand for engineers has never been as high as it is today. Uh, like. The, the need for people who can write code in the world will never go down because we'll always find new things that code can optimize. So if people in the audience want to learn code and make a living as a software engineer, don't worry, please do it. The world needs you anyway. Yeah, I think that it's all a matter of uh, quantity of the, when you multiply the quantity of software projects being created, you are multiplying the demand for software engineers to uh, do the custom things that you know, no code might not be able to do yet, or will will never be able to do. Um, so that is, if if you actually have like a hundred times many people creating companies around software, um, there's always going to be more and more demand for for those software companies to hire engineers to do the, like the really really complex things. And the same, we had the same story and the same fear when spreadsheets were were coming about, where it was like oh, like all the stuff that we do via code is now starting to like slowly be taken, taken away uh, and be done via these visual interfaces. And that actually only created more demand because it, it created more businesses that can now solve a lot of these business problems cheaper and faster, which then validated that, that um, market demand for whatever product that they're creating or whatever service that, that they were offering, which only led to them being more successful, having to hire more and more software engineers to solve um, the, the problems that these, these tools don't solve yet. So to me, it's, it's just a, um, it's actually going to call, it's, it's going to cause runaway demand, uh, for software engineers. Uh, so it's never been more lucrative to become a software engineer as it's never been more lucrative to become a no code, uh, software developer, uh, because there's just so much, so much demand for both and they're both growing exponentially. 
one yeah. thing I might, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Chris, go ahead. I was going to say, one thing I might add in there is I think one of the things that uh, engineers tend to bring is a little bit more of an architectural mind. And as you know, uh, even if you kind of know how to solve a problem, if you haven't thought through the architecture of it and the, and the framework, um, I actually think some of that skill set from an engineer really knowing how the, the depths of, of things work can be a wonderful asset to anybody building uh, who, who isn't technical, but can even get advice from them as to how to build well. I, yeah. I do think um, that more and more non-engineers uh, will take on that responsibility, however, like designers, product folks, like entrepreneurs, they like if given the right tools, they know how to think at a systems level, um, given if they understand the fundamentals of how data structured, of how business logic is structured, how uh, UIs are structured, like they're going to start um, creating design systems and well-structured data uh, databases uh, with like understood schemas um, logic that can be reused, et cetera. So I think more and more of that architectural thinking will move into the tools the same way that we see in, let's say, 3D animation tools, right? It used to be that a lot of the architectural pieces were in engineer land. And now it's the designers and the creative people who are like creating skeletal systems and constraint systems and like particle effect systems that are like inherently scalable because they, they are thinking about how do these systems add up to things that can be like maintained and understood over time, not just like solve a problem messily really quickly. Just the same way that a designer thinking about scale names their Photoshop layers, right? If they, um, you know, they need to um, kind of pass a file from one person to another, uh, they're thinking about architecture and information um, kind of structure. Uh, and, and I expect more and more of that um, to be in the brains of like what I call just visual developers, like software developers, as they think how their uh, solution is architected, the same way that somebody using Airtable today is really thinking about how is this going to scale. Yeah, absolutely. It makes me think about how we're bringing in these visual developers and they're working with these tools and it's kind of like they've got a tool set, but they don't realize like there's some like additional knowledge that's going to be very helpful for them. So they don't know what they don't know. And so when we provide that education and those resources and like I know all of these platforms are doing to help like bolster that up. So we're thinking in different ways, like because you really do have to think at a scale level at an architect level like you said versus just like you know point click here i'm done you know like no code doesn't mean that you're not doing any of the other things that you would be doing when you are developing the software yeah totally just to add on that um so the fact that 85 percent of our users are non-technical is a proof that if you're not technical, you can still think in these terms because if you don't think in these terms in bubble, you, you won't survive. Like data structure is kind of the first thing you're gonna have to think about. Where I think local tools have become very interesting is that it's actually easier to learn these concepts if you can get very fast feedback. And so if you try to teach this theoretically, given that the decision you're gonna be made in the old world, like, you know, you're gonna decide some stuff at the system level, but then you're gonna wait for engineers to build it. It's actually much harder to learn because you're gonna to have to wait for a long time before knowing that you're wrong. If you build, if you mess up your data structure in Bubble, you probably would get feedback about that like over a few days uh, because it's going to be a pain to add features, um, and then you go back and you fix it. So I, I actually think not only it is possible, but no code tools will make that learning that is very valuable and not actually that technical. I think it can be applied in many many places of the business world. Uh, will make it much easier for people. Awesome. Okay, we're going to do one last question before we get into the Q&A. So tell me what you are most excited to watch in the future of no code. What I'm hoping is that five years from now, we don't talk about no code anymore. And I really mean it because I really hope this just becomes a new way to build things. Similarly to, you know, when we went from like, very low level languages in the early 80s and then you know started to get to javascript we never talk about assembly language except if you work at apple and you're designing the next iphone and i hope we get into the same place to the same place in five years actually yeah five years is a reasonable time frame i think where you know you want to build a, a web app or website you don't even think that you need to write code you just go to the right tool for that and then that doesn't mean you would not go to low level if you need to uh, and most of these platforms end up being extensible with code because it is actually, I think, necessary in the long run to enable people to write code. Um, but that just becomes something for like specialists. But like normal people who try to build, uh, like non-technical people trying to build a business premise to software, will just use tools without thinking about no code. So I'm very much looking forward to having another panel five years from now where we just talk about building things. Yeah. 
I, I'm in the same boat. Um, but the thing that I'm most excited about is just the number of people that uh, can be empowered by this kind of technology. Uh, right now, we're, we're, we have this gap between who is aware of these tools and who actually has problems that they would want to solve in their life um, that, that can be solved by these tools already. Uh, and, and matching that demand and supply is a very exciting proposition because it, it means that you could lead to 10, if not 100 times as many people creating uh, things for the web uh, and solving uh, problems that are really valuable for them and can lead to uh, economic value for them, mean, for them to make a living, for them to make a product, for them to make a service. Uh, and I think over the next five years, we're going to see um, a huge wave of people making this realization and building uh, a lot of uh, really new ideas that um, are latent right now. People are just like sitting on them because they don't they don't feel like they have the right uh, enablement, the right tools to make it happen. Um, to, to them, it's sort of like a magical idea that someday uh, I might meet an app developer that will build this for me. Uh, but once we do that sort of like mental unlock and make people aware of, of these tools, I think we're going to have like a renaissance of um, creation on the web where so many more things are going to be created. Yeah, and I just uh, add to it, I, I hope that whole companies adopt these tools and, and whether we call them no code or, or, or whatever, uh, the, you know, when you're a new employee, you get trained on how, how we, how do we use, how do we solve problems here? What are the frameworks that we use and, and what are the sets of tools that we use? And hopefully the tools that have been talked about here are often just the, the de facto standard. Pretty much everybody uses them because they understand how to and, and how to solve problems in that particular organization. I think you would get to that really powerful renaissance in lots of companies. Agreed. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So our first question from the audience is for Emmanuel. It says, are you finding that you're to learn bubble and implementing solution themselves, or are they leveraging agencies and technical folks and asking them to use a low code tool like bubble? Is bubble low code? Would you say it's low code also? Because I um, now we get into the truly controversial yeah. topic. Uh, <laughs> it's actually tricky because uh, turns out we have a code editor to build plugins that is not low code. It's completely code. But then the product that people use most, like ninety eight percent of our, the applications, don't require custom code. And so I still very much I'm comfortable saying bubble is no code. To be very transparent, though. We kind of call the trend of no code. We used to call ourselves visual programming, which I think is actually a better description, but no code got enough traction that I think it makes sense to um, to adopt that for us. Um, in terms of uh, freelancer or people doing that themselves, we see both really. Um, it depends a little bit of the type of people. Uh, a lot of our market today is people starting companies on us, like building their customer facing products. If you do this, usually what we see is people want to do that themselves for the same reason that you don't really want to outsource your product development independently of the cost because you want to be able to make tweaks as a non-typical CEO, but with a strong product vision, you want to be able to make tweaks uh, yourself. So the pattern we usually see is someone building a product, starting a company, and then the higher bubblers who would be building, um, would join the team and work on the products that the founder can start doing more strategic work uh, or management work. That said, we do have an ecosystem of agencies, uh, probably, I, I think, smaller than Webflow, for instance. I think small, uh, Webflow has been bigger than us on that one. Um, and it's something we haven't pushed too hard yet. The reason being, we're still in a phase where we think that every new person that has the bubble skill set is a very strong asset for the company in the long run. And so in a world, whether you know I can have a 1,000 people knowing bubble or 10 agencies creating a 1,000 apps or 100 apps for people, I actually prefer having a 1,000 people who know how to use bubble. That said, this is probably something we're going to start structuring a little bit more in the future, because at some point, it's, there's still a need. Not everyone wants to be uh, in the weeds. Uh, and so we need to cater to these people as well. By the way, the perfect combination is experts uh, uh, or agencies that train Right. Uh, your users to then take over, um, right. which is a good combination because they almost serve as education, as support, as uh, kind of success and enablement. Right. Um, yeah. And then you get the best of both worlds. Yeah, we, we started a coaching marketplace, for instance, which was already happening, but now you can book by the hour people, um, which is a very interesting model. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Chris, what job functions, industries, and markets do you think can benefit the most from no code? 
you know, I, I think one thing we have talked about a lot here is people business, uh, basing their whole businesses on these products. I actually think there's a great opportunity inside companies to build uh, kind of internal and custom solutions for just the problems you have at kind of these mid-market and enterprise organizations. So HR teams, even IT and operations teams saying, hey, I actually want to build something with no code to help serve my internal customers. Uh, I think you can see some really good uh, increases in productivity, increases in workflow, because all of a sudden, how I interact with HR is just so much simpler. I've got less paperwork. I've got um, more of my data out there that I can just maybe update or whatever. And so I actually think those are some really cool ways that we'll see this uh, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's go with, do we have time for about one more question? Um, there are a lot in here. <laughs> um, are there any joint efforts between some of the no-code platforms, Webflow, Bubble, Adalo, to grow the movement and awareness together? It's a great Spirit. question. Um, we've we've tried to, you know, whenever we do no-code conf, um, uh, we're hoping that it comes back this year if if restrictions lift. Uh, we've always tried to do that as much as an industry movement as possible, like uh, invite as many folks as possible. Um, I think right now it's it's a bit of a, since, you know, Emmanuel mentioned that there, that bubble is used a lot more for like more complex apps, Webflow is used a lot for uh, websites and Zapier is used a lot for kind of automation, et cetera. Um, there's sort of less, less overlap where it's clear where we can collaborate, but there's also, as a movement, as this no code uh, idea, there's a, kind of a rising tide lifts all boats uh, situation that we're in right now. We're, we're so early in the industry that um, kind of helping more people understand the space uh, and not just like individual products, there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, I think for the most part, we've been kind of in our own lanes, building our own products, uh, but there's definitely more opportunity to work together. Well, one thing I'd say, uh, like this, except like for instance, the no code conf conference, I don't know how much we can collaborate on things, honestly, uh, but every company trying to propagate, you know, the no code idea um, is positive. And I have to say currently, I think we're, we're a space where, you know, competition is very friendly in a sense that we don't compete with each other, but we compete with code and skepticism. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something I, per I personally very much enjoy. Uh, Yep. It being in that space. Like we, we're not trying to show we're better than the other because it's just not the case. We're better for different use cases. Right. And it's such a massive, massive uh, market that is just getting started. And mostly we're competing with incumbents. You know, in our case, it's, you know, WordPress and Sitecore and all of these really right. uh, kind of legacy ways to build websites. Um, and in, in almost all cases, we're competing with non-consumption. We're competing with code. We're not competing with other products. Right. Uh, people aren't choosing between Webflow and Bubble. They're choosing between writing code, HTML and CSS and Webflow, or writing a bunch of uh, backend code and bubble, right? That, that's the trade-off usually. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, do you have anything you want to add to that as far as how you could see like collaboration furthering this space? But I think the, the thing that was talked about way earlier was this idea of proof points. And so to me, the more we can help educate the world on successful businesses, successful kind of operations that have gotten automated, that have gotten built on, on tools like this, I think we're, we in the internet world are all kind of lemmings and we chase the thing that we think is going to make us most successful. And so where we can be, be reminded, oh, like this works, this helps me solve these, uh, like this challenge I've gotten right in front of me. I think we, we, we can bring people together and get them using all kinds of no code tools. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is the time that we have for these questions. So in closing, do you each want to do like, just like a 10 second, here's where you can find me to learn more. Here's what we're building. And um, let's go Vlad first. Uh, sure. Thanks, Lacey. I'm, um, Less and less so on Twitter, but you can find me there at Call Me Vlad, and our website is webflow.com. You can uh, check us out. We're, um, if you're building a website, we're the place to go. I'll go next. So uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. I'm not extremely active, but I usually respond when people tweet at me at uh, us trash off. And uh, you'll have to check some websites to find the spelling of my last name. I apologize for that. Uh, and you can find us at bubble.io. Uh, and we're very much for if you want to build like a web application, so a 
fully functional product, uh, a web platform, come to us and uh, we'll do what we can to help you doing that. Yeah, and I, I'm probably most usefully found on LinkedIn and, and can connect there. And I'd say for us, we're really thinking about how do we help people automate and solve everyday problems and save the time that gets them back to the core job that they're actually supposed to be doing. And so excited about continuing that journey. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. I'll pass it back to you now. All right. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you, Lacey. Thanks, panelists. Uh, a lot of great information there. Uh, and thanks to you for your time today. If you haven't already, please check your inbox for a copy of the rise of the no code economy, Formstack's latest report exploring the no code movement, which includes original survey data for more than a thousand people across various industries, job levels, and company sizes. And in the report, uh, we're covering the understanding, usage, and growth of no code within organizations from startups to Fortune 500s. And you may even see some of our panelists featured in the report. A recording of this session will also be circulated in the next few days. As a reminder, No Code Day doesn't end here. Please join us on any of our social media channels to tell us how you're using No Code to reimagine your world of work. Have a great day, everybody.